Welcome. Emotions are everywhere. So how can we be smarter with our feelings? The answer is emotional intelligence, or EQ. We're delighted you're watching, because at six seconds, we're working towards one billion people practicing the skills of emotional intelligence. Can we count you in? Here on Six Seconds Channel, you'll find practical skills for work and life, inspiration for today, and support to build a better future for all. Welcome, everybody. We are delighted to have you back on our weekly live stream show. This is part of Growing You Online, which is our offering to support people to thrive in times of crisis. We know that in times like this, one of the most valuable things we can do is connect with our emotions and one another in an emotionally intelligent way. Today's panel on resilience for now and later We'll start in about six minutes. In the meantime, would you please say hello in the chat and tell us where you're from? I also would love to show you the schedule for the current week of growing you online. And you can see that tomorrow we'll continue on this theme of resilience with two classes. Um, those are classes that are part of the series, so you can keep following this theme if you're interested for the next few weeks. Also, I can show you the schedule for next week. And I wanted to emphasize our panel for next Tuesday about finding purpose in these trying times. Today's panel on resilience will start in about three minutes. Before I introduce you to your moderator of today's session, I just want to mention how grateful we are that you're participating and you're here today. The participants in these sessions have been incredibly generous by sharing events, signing up for classes, making donations, and sending us messages of support. This is a very hard time to be running a nonprofit, and we're doing our best because we know how urgently the world needs more EQ. And because of your support, we're able to keep going. So now let me please introduce you to the moderator for today's session, Joshua Friedman. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm very excited about today's session. Uh, I think that this question about what resilience really means for us is uh, actually fairly urgent in uh, many of our lives today and in most of our businesses and in our societies. So we have a fantastic group of speakers today uh, from all over the world. And um, panelists, I would uh, invite you to go ahead and turn on your webcams and unmute yourselves. And <clears throat> we'll go ahead and um, get started. I, um, just speaking for myself to, to start with, I'll tell you, I have hit the wall in the last few days. And, um, you know, this last, I don't know, it feels like years of uh, shelter in place and trying to grapple with the uncertainty is um, it's the most difficult work I've ever done as a leader. Um, as a person, I just find myself struggling with the really big feelings and a lot of complexity. And so when the subject of this panel um, came up, I thought, okay, <clears throat> this is one that's going to really help me. And I imagine that there are a lot of people watching who are likewise um, finding, um, you know, these deep waters that we're in. We can do that for a while, but as this challenge continues and goes on, and unfortunately, I think on and on, we're going to need a lot more uh, resilience. So to start with, I would like you to each introduce yourself by answering this question. <clears throat> and if you could just give a 30 second intro plus answer. Just imagine a million people are going to jot down a key phrase. They're going to write it on a post-it and they're going to stick it on their mirror or their fridge or someplace next to their computer. They're going to see it every day. What are the few words 
you want them to write down and pay attention to, to help them increase resilience. So Sally, let's start with you. Hi, Josh, uh, Sally Dominguez. Well, I'm a designer so, um, so, and, a, and a strategist. So I will do a visual for my jot down. And what it will be is it will say, you have epic resilience, but the epic will be in quadrants. And that's a daily check-in to have a look at that and think about emotional, physical, intellectual, and creative resilience. And just, and just run through that for yourself and check off that you're, you're hitting each of those on the daily with something. That, that's 30 seconds, right? Beautiful, Chris. <laughs> uh, very much aligned actually, and it coincides with uh, the resilience diagnostic that we've been developing with Six Seconds along with Joni, where we had the four domains of resilience is on a daily basis checking in on each of those. And I think also from someone that comes from a, a sport-based background is ensuring that you don't overplay your strengths. So exercise is one of my big strengths, but you can often just pile into the, pile into the exercise scenario and neglecting the emotional side, the mental side, and your whole purpose. Great, and Laura, since you're right there, let's go to you. Oh, for me, it would have to be smile. Smile, laugh, and connect with at least three people. Write it on your fridge. Rashad. Are we still doing introductions too? Yes. Great. But some of us are having trouble with that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Rashad Bartholomew out of Oakland, California, former pro athlete way back when, played, signed with the Tennessee Titans out of college, um, two-time entrepreneur, first in uh, EdTech, built the most uh, comprehensive data and assessment platform in California way back in the early 2000s, uh, more recently launched a mobile app called StylePass, um, and now I'm a uh, account exec at, New, uh, at uh, GitLab. Uh, I have to make these introductions every day when I'm with customers, so it's kind of, kind of what I do. Um, anyhow, uh, regards to the, the takeaway I'd have for people is that adversity is an opportunity for greatness. I think everyone wants to be great, um, and it sounds very flowery and very aspirational, but do we do the work when we have adversity? That is our chance, that's our moment. Step up and seize it, be great. Imagine if everyone did do the right thing when times were tough, and how much better the world would be. Joni. So I certainly concur with what's been said and uh, building on what Chris said about our resilience tool is that it does have the four domains. So we do need to look at emotions, mind, body, and purpose. I run a business called Resilient People. So my entire focus is how can we be resilient? And I pride myself in simplicity at the far side of complexity. So I would have two post-its next to me and uh, right next to my computer. The first is specific, is to say every hour, stand up and do some light movement for exactly two minutes. Exactly, Josh, that's perfect. <laughs> so what does that do? It just gives your brain a bit of a breather. It it lowers your cortisol and we do know the old adage that sitting is the new smoking and it's fantastic science to back up the fact that if you did that for two minutes every hour you would reduce uh, the uh, possibility of dying from many different causes by 33 percent i'll be swift because i know my 30 seconds is nearly up but i absolutely live and die by the fact that we have to honor our circadian rhythm and have uh, go to sleep at the same time every night and josh i see a lot of emails coming from you at the very late hours so we should be getting into bed at a good time and uh, making sure that we get between seven and eight hours sleep a night. That is inextricably linked to our immune system, our mood and our productivity. So sleep eight hours and honor thyself would be my other post-it. Sandrine. Yeah, hi everyone. And I will go back to the exercise of introducing myself as well. And uh, um, I'm Sandrine and as you can hear, I'm French and I'm based in the UK and uh, I'm, a, I'm a keynote speaker and a senior mindfulness trainer at Potential Project and also a mindfulness-based stress reduction and BSR teacher. And I think we will need a big fridge or whatever, wherever we post these, uh, these post-its. I agree with uh, all what has been said already. And I would add um, a quote actually, because I find always quotes very inspirational. And this one is from William James, the founder of the 
modern psychology, what you attend to in this moment becomes your reality. So yeah, the quality of my life is really determined by the focus of my attention. And where is my attention right now? Is it on the positive? Is it on something more negative and rumination? And train it to be here and now. Wow. That just kind of smacked me in the face, actually, as I think about the last few days where my focus has been on uh, mm. very annoying things <laughs> like uh, our federal uh, loan program. <clears throat> but I don't want to get into that topic right now. Um, this word resilience, uh, it's one of those words that I think, you know, we use all the time, like, you know, leadership or happiness, but I don't actually think a lot of people have thought that much about what it means. Um, Chris, would you give us a, a quick start on what does it mean? And yeah, by the sure. way, I just mentioned something very cool that maybe not everybody mentioned in their introductions, uh, Sally's in uh, California from Australia. Laura and Chris are from the UK in Switzerland. Rashad is in California. Uh, Joni's in South Africa. Sadrine is from France in the UK, right? <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm in California as well. So we have a really broad range of uh, uh, international perspectives here, which I think is rich for this conversation. Okay, Chris, what the heck is resilience? Well, first off, to just a couple bases where we didn't perform on their last task, uh, myself and Lara co-run a business called Momentum4, which is a business uh, which uh, designs and delivers learning, learning development initiatives in the business. Our, our strap line is uh, people performance, business growth. That's what we've been doing now for 25, 30 years. In terms of resilience, uh, I think from a business point of view, the much used phrase of the ability to bounce back is, uh, is overused and uh, we don't really see it like that because if you're bouncing back is a bit like a trampoline type scenario. You don't really want to bounce back the situation you just came from in many instances. So I would say it'd be the, uh, the capacity to prepare for, uh, recover from and adapt in the face of stress and adversity uh, or challenge. And on a, on a daily basis, that's what we're facing right now. And once we get back to the, the new normal of work, again, on a daily basis, we face challenge and adversity and to go back on points of, um, I, for, I beg your pardon, I've forgotten um, the uh, Ed, uh, let me put, it was Russia. <laughs> you're, uh, you're Chris, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. Laura. <laughs> I forgot my wife's name. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll work on that. The resilience training is going to uh, come after the yeah, webinar. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, resilience is fine. The dementia is just early onset right now. But what Rashid said about seeing is, is, is grasping um, positions of adversity and sort of challenging yourselves in your values, beliefs, and to try and turn them around into, into, the, uh, into successes. And I mean, an analogy really comes back to me from professional golf, which is a sport that I'm, I love, but I'm not a great golfer. So your average golfer puts a ball into a bunker and that's it you'll often see people throwing their clubs down the fairway, whereas often a professional golfer will aim for a bunker. And your phrase phrase is now, this is OTE, opportunity to excel. Great. Joni, uh, I want to go off script here for a minute uh, because you've shared this uh, before. I know you had an experience in your life where you... Um, found yourself without enough resilience. And that led you into this path. And uh, I mean, Chris's answer was fantastic, but could we get it a little more personal? What happened for you when you were in that place of struggle? So the context is I was running a business pretty much like Chris and Laura with my husband and um, he unfortunately had an aortic aneurysm and died within six seconds. So it was a very unexpected death. He was 49 years old and running a business together, running a home together. We were we both very sporty, studying the Enneagram together. It, it really was, as the psychiatrist said to me at the time, he said, Joni, I know, no wonder you have suicidal thoughts because actually every dimension of your life, work, home, 
business, children, sport and study, six major dimensions, and the financial dimension, the seventh, has been crippled. So Josh, yeah, the point of um, being suicidal after a, a very sudden loss of a, a partner, romantic business and father to my children, um, was a very, very, very deep and dark place. So I have walked the journey in the last 12 years of how do I become resilient? How do I adapt to the new normal? And um, it took some time, it looks, took lots of different pillars, which is not the, the um, part of the, the answer to your question. But I would like to say what Chris said with another third part is, uh, yes, you, life happens. And uh, I like the saying, life gets you to it and emotional intelligence gets you through it. And I would add that resilience and emotional intelligence get you through it. But I think post tragedy, adversity and challenge, one has to bounce forward. And uh, that's really what kept me going. My children were seven and nine at the time is that resilience is not about just being having certain pillars that will help keep you upright and then bouncing back. But it's also about saying the new normal is bouncing forward with agility. And uh, that's really a phrase that I keep uppermost in mind is that how do I bounce forward and how do I role model that in self care and how I self manage because a lot of resilience is about self managing and then to my significant others and the most important are my, my two young daughters who are now 20 and 22. Thank you for sharing that Joni. Sally, I saw you nodding your head as I'm Joni was talking. <laughs> what did that? I'm what did I, that I was nodding from both from the personal adversity bit, which is what led me to develop the Epic system that I'm working on now. Um, but also that idea of bouncing forward, you know, so, so my, um, my day job is I, I architected a strategy called adventurous thinking, and it's all about um, putting yourself outside your expertise and knowledge into this mental area of, of bearable discomfort in order to deal with exponential change. So this is what I've been kind of going around the world and, and, and teaching and activating for the past couple of years. Um, and all of a sudden we have this expo exponential change upon us. You know, everybody talked about this idea of fourth revolution coming with this huge exponential change and technologies and uncertainty. Suddenly it's thrust upon us a bit quicker than we thought. Um, and I think what's interesting in that is, so I've already been helping people understand that you know, to find opportunity in chaos, you need to be comfortable in this kind of discomfort. So you need to have the kind of physical and mental stability, but in order to bounce, bounce forward instead of just bouncing, I think you need extra. You need to be looking at um, intelligence and continuing knowledge, but at the same time, because knowledge is moving so fast at this point, we're finding out new things every day. So expertise keeps changing. It's just as important to feel creatively current, not I mean, look, yeah, sure, that can mean you're an artist, but it can also mean that you're questioning, you're, you're comfortable questioning things, you're comfortable not knowing and creating in this area of, of uncertainty. So, you know, Deepak Chopra says uncertainty is neutral. And so, you know, this idea of resilience as the way you face adversity, the way you harness that energy, and then you take that energy, roll it in a ball and move forward with it. So I think so, you need not only to, you need to be physically fit in order to function every day in that mental state. You know, I'm going to go over to Sandrine to continue this because Sandrine, yeah. I know part of your work is about how do we find that, that comfort with discomfort? Tell us what is it, what does discomfort really mean for our brains? Yeah, I think it's really uh, for us, uh, Resilience, many people have their own defi definition and actually this word was not known at all, at all before the crisis. And now it's the big word. And it's this capacity to be, to be um, in the eye of the storm, fully grounded, this discomfort that we can feel of maybe being really completely unbalanced or hooked by, by rumination, negative figures that we hear every day, all, all this suffering that is around. And developing this and cultivating a resilience mindset with those three core qualities of being able to be present again this focus on the present moment where actually this is okay right now there is a chaos around me but there is this stability fully grounded in this moment and facing adversity and difficulty without grasping or judging being really unhooked from our negative negativity bias 
so that's I'm going to stop I'm going to stop you there for a second and Rashad I want to go back to you as a professional athlete you certainly grappled with that first thing that Sandrine was talking about a lot of complexity a lot of chaos how did you find yourself able to maintain your focus on the field uh well I think on the field actually it's it's comparatively easy to a lot of other things that I've done um on, on the field you come back to your teammates right you come back to your family you come back to your identity much of that is very much rooted in just who you believe you are as a as a player right and if you've made it to the pro level that that aspect is very much entwined with who you are as a person and you're the best at you know kicking the ball if you believe that you're the best at kicking the ball if you have a bad kick you're going to come back and you're going to try better try harder the next time to prove that, right? Uh, I think it's, I think there are other less certain situations. I think uncertainty plays a big role in it. Um, and as a former entrepreneur, that uncertainty along with the adversity is kind of a, a, a multiplier of challenge that you, I don't think athletes go through in the same way as an entrepreneur would go through having done both, mm -hmm. but. Thank you. Um, Laura, there's a question in the chat from uh, Eric Smith that I think is really important. Um, sometimes people talk about resilience and a lack of resilience as kind of a most a way of blaming individuals, you know, oh, well, Josh, you're not exercising enough and that's why your life is difficult right now. Um, and kind of not confronting the societal factors what's happening in the institutions around us, what's happening in kind of dysfunctional systems in which we operate. So how do we build, how do we extend this idea of resilience to creating systems of resilience? Wow. That's a biggie. <laughs> well, um, I know, just for example, I know you and Chris have been working with uh, a big bank who's we're not allowed to say the name of on this very problem for the last several years of saying, okay, well, individual resilience is important, but actually as a multinational bank, we have to actually build systems. What does that look like uh, in an institution? Well, I think it can look like a token gesture in many organizations. And as some people say, a tick in the box exercise. However, what we've observed from many of our big corporate clients in working in this field for many years is that they, they do have a part to play. And it is that compassionate leadership it is the ability to um, be heard within organizations and, 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 and feel that you're you know, being listened to and that connectiveness. And I think what's happened in these current times is that has been really accentuated. People are saying to me now, they're feeling more connected um, remotely than they were when they were located in the office. So for me, the learning of maintaining what is good that is coming out of these times, these you know, times of adversity, is that we recognize that people do want to feel nurtured and cared for and be told the truth. And I think that goes up to the government. Yeah. Sandrine, let's come back to I feel what we need. Sandrine, let's come back to you continuing on this theme. What does it look like to have resilience in an organization or system? Yeah, I think it, it's 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 building a culture of resilience. And what does that mean, building a culture? How can we embark everyone um, by, by, by listening to everybody, I think, and uh, not limiting the sphere of maybe a, a board or a, a group of individuals, but reaching out to everybody in the organization, listen deeply to everyone. Um, and I think this is what we see happening at the moment. We, we really reconnect to our true nature of social beings, you know, feeling the connection that we are all together in this. And mm. I see tremendous amount of people really reaching out to help, to be of service and to cooperate. Uh, rather than being always in competition. And I, I think that's, that's also what can bring a more resilient society in the future, really emphasize more the cooperation in our, in our capabilities as human beings. Sally, I want to bring this to you and maybe extend a little even further as we think about 
teams, organizations? What does it look like to have a resilient society? Mm, it, this is a this is a place I do a lot of work as kind of futurist projection, and I think. Um, you know, here in the Bay Area, we lost power for three days at, at one point. Um, and most of the people that live around me panicked completely. The anger level shot up, much like the early days of the COVID-9 stuck at home thing. Um, people were aggressive to each other. People panicked. Um, those of us who go to Burning Man every year whipped out the generator and the solar panels and weren't too worried about it. But what it really, what it really impressed upon me and something that I've been into for a long time is decentralization. So I think at societal level, what we see is resilience as the ability for neighborhoods and communities to, to a degree, fend for themselves in the area of energy, water, food security, this idea of decentralized production, decentralized supply. We're lucky in the Bay Area, those of you who are with me in the Bay Area, or even California, that we have an incredibly um, strong supply of food and vegetables and, and basically really fresh, fantastic everything. Um, Australia, not so much, right? Some, some other countries, not so much. People inland, not so much. And so in times of stress like this, when you see supply chains compromised, you think about society and resilience and realize that this idea of decentralization in terms of some of your fundamental needs is, um, you know, it's, it's overlooked and we need to really focus on that as I think businesses need to look at that and governments need to look at that. And then we, as the people need to look at what we want to do. But certainly in my community, we talk about like, we have little gardens, we share food. I have emergency water. We have power. Joni, you have uh, been through some interesting challenges societally growing up in South Africa, and maybe you can speak to what is your vision of a resilient society in addition to what's been said? Uh, I would uh, concur with a lot of what Sally has just said, is that we're looking at this interdependence in South Africa, because we do have a problem at the moment now that our Gini coefficient is far bigger. So the rich have got richer, and then we have really poor people. And at the moment with COVID-19, we are still in lockdown, stage five, we are not allowed out of our homes. And obviously with 58 million people and 80% uh, of those people living in townships, they're living just a few meters apart. So it's problematic in terms of lockdown, it's problematic in terms of food supply, it's problematic in terms of the informal sec uh, sector of society and making money. So we have a huge starvation problem at the moment. And from a resilience perspective, building on what Sally said, is we have got these pockets around the country of gathering food and mobilizing food and mobilizing water to the informal settlements to help people in need. So it's pretty much also what Lara said earlier is that actually during lockdown in this adverse time, there are people that are coming together. There's some beautiful leveling of the playing fields in terms of hum humanity and interconnectedness and real empathy that has resulted in positive resilience actions that have taken place. So our country is by no means out of the doldrums and Moody's has downgraded downgraded us economically, but uh, there, are, there are some upsides to, to going through these challenges. You do pop out into a new normal, and sometimes uh, with that agility of change and reorientation, you will see some more um, different playing fields happening. So one last practical example is we have two very distinguished school systems in South Africa. We've got a private school system and a government school system. And these rural children who are not going to school, I foresee as a futurist kind of lens on is that they, we will twin schools now more with remote studying and using technology. So that some of the schools who are vastly left behind, we now have realized that technology can start to level the playing fields. So, um, yeah, we will, we will come out this better, I hope, but it's not going to be a quick fix. We've got quite a few hoops to go through because of the state of the economy. I want to come back to Sandrine's quote at the beginning and this idea of you know, where, what we're paying attention to and being future oriented. And uh, certainly one of the things that uh, inspired me from the example of South Africa ending apartheid and the process of uh, reconciliation that happened was a focus on the future. And who do we want to be as a nation? Who do we want to be as human beings? Um, Rashad, we haven't heard from you for a while to put you on the spot here. When you're deep in struggle and you're finding yourself um, 
you know, in that place of, of, of getting lost, what is the future you're looking to? What is, what is the kind of hook that pulls you, your vision uh, away from the mire? Uh, well, I, I think I'm, I, I'm pretty fortunate. I, I have a couple of mindsets that stay at the forefront. Um, one, I always have a 10 or 20 year goal. I always have a long-term goal, right? That's kind of my North star that I'm kind of drifting towards or decide or, you know, determined to push forward on. So when I hit a road bump, right, that knocks me off course, I still know what direction I want to end up going. And so it gives me a starting point from which to build. Um, Chris, let's bring that to you as well. Uh, what's your noble goal? How did, what does that do for your resilience? I think uh, in terms of a noble goal, it's sort of wound up, it's bound up with a whole idea of a purpose. So we think about some of the work we do, especially with, and I don't want to tar every single law firm with the same brush, but we'll often go into law firms and we'll run resilience initiatives and their overarching aim is to get their associates to work for 22 hours a day rather than the mere 18. So we're just trying, they try and make them more robust. So then working with other firms where this whole noble goal and purpose and being engaged with your purpose is key. So it's having that purpose and making sure from a leadership point of view that you're engaging with your people. And this isn't a financial metric. Again, if we, if we look at some of the business we've done, especially with some of the big building firms we work with, and again, can't really name them, but talking to, in fact, Lara did the work with this particular guy with their MD, and we spoke about the purpose of the business. And it was just like a huge telephone figure financial metric, which meant nothing to the reception staff, which meant nothing to the junior associates. So it's having a clear leadership vision and purpose that engages your people. And if you think about resilience, purpose is one of the key domains of resilience. Sandrine, I want to come back to the mindfulness and what you were talking about earlier. Being present, and yet at the same time, <coughs> leaning into the future. How do we balance those two things? Yeah, I, may, I may first maybe uh, just readjust what I said. It's, it's being present really in this situation right now, not necessarily then going straight into the future where of course there is probably hope and a, and a good thing to happen. But at the moment, I am in this situation right now. And how can I really develop this capacity to be okay with the situation as it is? Because this is the first step to accept the situation before moving on. So um, for me, it's all about training this resilience, practicing mindfulness, of course, by cultivating uh, this attentional balance while I ask all our participants here joining us today to really become aware, first of all, uh, of one activity or a thought that is not helping you in these days, that brings you into negativity, into spirals of thoughts and rumination and really not helpful. And becoming aware of those things that you do every day that brings you in, in that bad place. And then doing the opposite as well, really reflecting and writing down one activity or thought that is really helpful for you right now when you do it brings you up to joy to some positive uh, thinking and attitude uh, for for your current moment and once you know that you have this choice to really choose to redirect your attention and focus to what is supportive right now and that brings us a lot of really freedom to let go of what is unhelpful and that it is an activity, an emotion, a mindset. But the first thing is to become aware of it. Thank you, Sandrine. I um, am a CEO. <clears throat> I have uh, a lot of people who um, are looking to me for leadership. And uh, in times like this, that uh, involves a lot of emotional support. And so I find myself getting a lot of messages of somebody saying, I'm really struggling with X, I need help with Y, can you help me figure out what to do with Z? And part of the challenge is that my honest answer is I don't know. And uh, I feel this terrible responsibility to 
be able to support people to figure out a solution, but I don't know what it is. So Laura, can I have some free coaching? What's, what's your <laughs> advice? Well, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we talk a lot um, as, as coaches, in, you know, within six seconds within our business. And I know Joni around um, the first thing to identify is the emotion and say it out loud, how are you feeling? And as Sandrine was talking there, and I really, you know, um, absolutely agree with everything you said, Sandrine. It's, uh, I've got a friend of mine who has got cancer and it happened, her treatment was happening at the time of lockdown. And when we are faced, you know, in these times of adversity, when you are challenged, um, uh, I, I just think back to her response. And it, it just, she, she said to me, I feel cheated that COVID-19 has cheated me of my cancer holiday. This is the first time I've had off work my whole career <laughs> and I just I laughed yeah like you Josh at that response because I, I felt wow you know there she is it's fighting for her life and actually she's reframed it and we spoke a lot about her her emotions and how she felt when she got diagnosed and I think I think that's it Josh it's all you can do in the moment stay in the moment be present um, as, as with the kids appreciate what you have be grateful and the purpose will still be there when we come out of this, if it fits in with your core values and your beliefs. So keep, keep holding on to that. But actually right now, just say it out loud how you're feeling. If you're feeling anxious, you know, tell people, you're the CEO, it's just a, it's just a label. You know, don't let it define you, you're a human being first. And I think that's what makes us resilient. Rashad, let's go over to you with this, this same question. You've been in this hot seat multiple times, leading a business when things are not going as planned. What's your resilience strategy? Uh, I think, you know, what you said earlier about people coming to you with problems and you not knowing the answer, I, that resonates 100%. I've been there. Um, that's tough. I think that resilience is really planned ahead of time. And I think several on this panel have alluded to that. Um, you don't wait until you're under, you know, under fire to start prepping. You're prepping all the time. And I think uh, someone shared a kind of a framework, um, mind, body, emotions, purpose. If I can build on that one more, especially in the business context is finance, right? Coming into this meeting here, I had four mind, body, emotions, and finance. And you're always stacking your chips. You're always thinking about getting that next round of investment. If, you're, if you are an entrepreneur or CEO, if you are a working person like myself now, um, I'm always thinking about, gosh, a COVID-19 could happen. You know, I probably should have, a, you know, a, a fund set up for a rainy day so that perhaps I can take a COVID-19 holiday just because the world is shut down. In this case, I can't. But, you know, I mean, like coming out of the 2008 recession, I knew that there would be another time. And I wanted to be able to say, you know what? I'm taking holiday this time, right? I'm not going to stress out like everyone else. I'm going to just take a chill, right? So I think all these things about resilience are there are mindsets you can use in the moment when the rubber meets the road. But hopefully you're preparing ahead of time and stacking your mental, emotional, physical, and financial chips. So that way you're ready when something does happen. I want to come back to that topic of the future in a moment. Sandrine, something to add here on this challenge. Yeah, Josh, I, I really resonate with what you just said. And um, because, you know, I am confronted with a lot of people who are expressing their, their pain, their suffering in this current situation. And there is always a part of, of, of me. And when we are of service to people, we want to bring solutions. We want to help and, and alleviate all this pain and suffering. And, this is where it's really important to see how can we avoid this empathic, empathetic um, hijack and make this really difference between empathy that we really need to, uh, to connect, to have a bridge with the person, but then as well transform this into compassion, which is very neurologically um, different, where this brings us to this action. And sometimes the action can, can just be um, come alongside and just having a sort of a, um, compassionate companionship and just be there knowing, well, yeah, 
there is my role is maybe not at certain times to bring solutions and fix things, but just be here with the person. And uh, that makes us truly, truly human. I think for me, a big learning in this is um, remembering what my job is and isn't. And um, it, it isn't to fix everything. Mm -hmm. um, but also remembering that these difficult feelings aren't bad things. There's a, a Buddhist um, proverb, which is suffering comes from denying what is. And the, the premise is that being unhappy, being in pain, being in misery isn't actually suffering. Suffering is, trying, is trying to deny that and reject that and push that away. May I comment? Please, Sally. Can I, because I, I, it's interesting. I have a completely different point of view to everything I've heard so far in that, in that I think it's really important to have this emotional resilience and empathy and compassion, but all of that is reactive. And if you want to bound forward and not just bounce, you have to have a tool or tools or a mindset that helps you thrive. So coping is one aspect of resilience, but actually you, you want to, as we discussed earlier, bounce forward in resilience. You want to, I mean, and, and, and to your point, Josh, when you said you don't have the answers, of course you don't. This is uncharted territory. And I think one really important aspect of resilience is to feel comfortable in that and to feel capable in your own ability to navigate uncertainty and not knowing. If you have, if you feel creatively current and you feel like you've got a handle on uncertainty, you'll bound forward. So I just want to put that in there because it's kind of getting a little bit depressing in that, yeah, it's really hard, right? And you're confronted and it's difficult, but it's actually really exciting. Uncertainty is really exciting if you bring a creative confidence to it in terms of thinking, in, thinking into new strategies. This is a huge opportunity for massive change for the better. Just wanted to so I have some. Can I build on that, Sally? Josh, if you don't mind, if I <laughs> go build ahead. On Sally, is that um, Sally? I think you've got a great point there. And of course, uh, the two words you use, bounce forward or bound forward. Chris, Laura, and myself speak a lot about energy and optimal energy and performance in what we do with the resilience tool that we're designing. You cannot bounce forward or bounce, you know, bound forward unless you've really got great energy. So the self-management that we each need on a daily basis is hugely important. Mm -hmm. I'm a CEO of my business, plus I'm a president of another Southern African business. And I really look at a practical way of managing my energy on a daily basis. So I bookend my day. I definitely start with a, a meditation in the morning and that's before I do anything. So that's a good start to my day. And then I have a very good end to my day. And the very good end to my day is a three-part question, which grounds me pretty much what Sandrine said in the now and the present. But it also paves the way pretty much what Rashad said for the future. So if I can share something very practical, at the end of the day, here's a behavior that you can do while you are brushing your teeth. So you never forget to brush your teeth. Yes, am I right, everybody? So you're never going to forget this. It's a three-part three questions you can ask yourself. So the first thing as I'm brushing my teeth at night is what do I choose to let go of today that's going to deplete my energy? And let me tell you, it could be a horrendous fight with one of my daughters. Today I had to sort out a conflict issue on a board level, um, which was of huge magnitude. And because I'm president of the board, I took no nonsense, but it, it took a lot of energy for me to stake my claim. I'm going to let that go tonight. The second thing that I say to myself is, what am I grateful for today? We know that the hard wires, the brain vastly differently. So there are various things throughout the day that I might be grateful for. And today I have to tell you, my gratitude is pretty simple. As I look to my veggie garden and there's a beautiful broccoli growing and I'm hugely grateful for that. It's the first time I've ever grown broccoli. So it can be simple. But the third thing pretty much to Rashad said is the being prepared is I do at night when I'm brushing my teeth think, and this really goes back to again, what Chris had to say as well about noble goals is that I think about what am I going to do tomorrow, a chunk of my time to align with my noble goal and my purpose, which is obviously a domain of resilience. But by the end of the day, if you book in with that, it's amazing you wake up the next day with really good energy. That's a proviso that you had the seven to eight hours sleep. We cannot do anything in self-managing or enabling the members of our associations, et cetera, to do well, unless we 
role model that we are really managing ourselves with energy and optimal energy and performance. Okay, uh, we are amazingly running out of time. Um, and uh, so I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is, I don't think this is the last global crisis we're going to be grappling with. Uh, this is big, it's everywhere, it's intense. Um, but as uh, I think Sally said at the beginning, we've talked for years about we're in an era of disruption and there are gonna be more disruptions and uh, maybe there are gonna be more pandemics and maybe there are gonna be more you know, flooding and. Uh, there are all kinds of threats on the horizon. And so that's the bad news. The good news is I brought my magic wand uh, to lend each of you for a moment. And um, as you think to the future and building capacity, you're going to be in charge of the world for a moment. Uh, as the person in charge of the world for the moment with this magic wand, what is going to build the resilience that we need for the future? And Sally, let's start with you. <laughs> Just two seconds to think about that. Um, <laughs> look, I think what's going to build resilience at personal community, and and I don't, I'm not even thinking about government right now. It's a bit of a, sh I won't even say the word. I, I think what's going to build resilience is the the sudden understanding that we need a level of decentralization along with a level of centralization. What we're used to isn't always going to answer. Um, these sort of supply disruptions and people disruptions that we're seeing. And so it's a moment for people to reflect on what they do and make the changes that were probably way overdue. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the level of connection and I'm excited about the level of self-reflection right now at business and at personal level. Bing, that's the one. <laughs> uh, actually, I would say that um... My question is really a question for this panel because you guys are experts or guys and girls are experts. Um, and that really is, is there a framework we can use for societal resist resilience? Um, several of you voiced a framework about personal resilience. And I think it'd be really great if we could start thinking about a framework for societal resilience and kind of pushing that idea through, uh, maybe starting at the grassroots with people like ourselves and eventually going up through the local and federal governments around the world. Well, my, my, my answer to, to that, Rashad, is uh, that we need to both grow individual personal capabilities and I think reweave the social fabric. And what I see is a lot has become very visible in this pandemic that, that was present before, um, levels of inequity, levels of systematized uh, inequality, levels of corruption, levels of self-interest, levels of social and economic systems that aren't serving us. And we've tolerated those because it's been okay, but it's, we're confronting the fact that it's actually not okay. Uh, it used to only be not okay for a relatively small group. And now I think we're confronting it's not okay for a lot of people. So I think we need to, uh, it's a very interesting kind of struggle and paradox to do the work internally and uh, build our own capabilities and strengths to stack those chips as you talked about, but also to open our sphere of concern, open our hearts to a bigger lens and feel that we are actually in this life raft together. And I think for most of us, most of the time, we're kind of in, we see ourselves as islands and I think that if we, it, to me, it starts with an emotional experience. If we feel the fundamental connectedness of all life, if we feel that every part of this planet is, is, is it, it, it's all connected and we are part of that, from that emotional experience comes the opportunity to reweave. Joni, magic wand over to you. My magic wand actually is a hybrid. So it's a hybrid of saying how can we have this interconnectedness in geographic profit pockets. So as communities, we live certainly in community and then how do we live interdependently between communities? So that sounds a little bit esoteric at a level, 
But um, I, uh, in the 80s, spent a lot of time living on various uh, kibbutzes in Israel. And it was really an interesting time to see how the kibbutzniks worked in geographic uh, areas and how they interdependently worked to, to build up the country of Israel. And uh, that would be my magic wand, is how do we interconnect in these pockets and then across territories as well. Sandrine. Yeah, first, I think uh, um, if I had this magic um, thing in my hand, lots of big amount of humility first, because that's, that's a tough job and uh, we must acknowledge that. And where I fully resonate with, um, with Sally is, yes, we have a great opportunity here in this challenge. We, we should not forget that we were in a bigger crisis before. The climate change was a big crisis. We tend to forget it or ignore it sometimes a bit too much, but this crisis now is an opportunity, and I have really big hopes for that, to, uh, to, turn, to turn to green a bit more. And, um, and, and I feel we are really at a turning point of history here of our humanity. Can we make this change happen now by certainly listening more, again, cultivating the beginner's mind, asking questions, a lot of questions, and younger people need to be heard more so that we can bring this change, because otherwise we are stuck in our failing models. So listen more to young people and asking questions, questions, questions. It's a beautiful reminder of last week's uh, uh, video that's available on our channel about um, emotions and climate. And we had an incredibly moving and powerful conversation with people from 18 to 70 something from 14 different countries talking about this connection between emotions and being a climate activist and building a, a future that actually works for all of us. Chris, magic wand is yours. I guess sort of pitching in with some emotionally intelligent competencies, fundamental to which is awareness of self, but also awareness of others. Um, because right now, many of us are pushing some pretty big boulders up a hill. And many of these boulders are invisible to the eye. Um, what from the, from the outside looks like certain people in certain positions with certain income, they have no issues at all. But if you scratch beneath the surface, they struggle as much as anyone else. And I think as we've, as we've all sort of relayed that this isn't the last time this is gonna happen. So I think getting back to what Rashida said about being comforted in adversity. And if you do have some of the core competencies of resilience based around the four domains, it's soft selling this into other people or other communities. So that when issues and situations do occur, we see these as challenges rather than threats and then we can all thrive. And Lara? Um, well, yeah, my wand is looking at my two daughters and thinking about the future. And like Sally, I feel very optimistic and excited about the level of change that we can create because people, that we're, we're all going through this together. And I think there is a, 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 the biggest connectedness globally that I've ever felt um, in the people that I talk to, whether it be New Zealand, Australia, California, you know, in Europe, I, I, I'm feeling this wave of change. Um, Rashid, to, to Rashid's point, I don't know what that change looks like. And, and maybe there does need to be more experts putting their heads together to look at this to build that um, but I do feel very I'm very optimistic about our future because of collaboration and, and I think just the immense size of this pandemic and the fact that it may happen again I think people are feeling that this this could happen again so we need to implement these changes we need to um, make sure we don't go back to the norm you know let's 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 define what the new norm looks like um, so yeah, I, I, I'm excited. I'll just wave my wand. <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm I'm taking away something that uh, is really the six seconds model of emotional intelligence. What I'm hearing is what we call know yourself, being here now, feeling, 
there's these emotions are data. They're not bad and they're not good. It's just noticing what's happening and being in that. And then from that to the next step, we call choose yourself and saying, oh, actually I have a lot of options. I have a lot of options individually. We have a lot of options in our businesses and our societies. How do we expand those options? And we might not know what the solution is, but can we find options? And then the third step we call give yourself, which is about feeling that connection with the larger world and with the future and our own noble goals, our own sense of purpose. What do we want to be contributing? What is this about for us in the long term? And then do it again and then do it again. And every time we go through that cycle, something becomes more clear. So thank you all uh, for helping me. And I hope those of you who are watching, uh, I'd also helped you to find a little bit more clarity, to be present and to see options and to feel connected with that future and the possibilities. Uh, Tom, we're going back to you. Panelists, thank you so much for uh, being here and sharing. Those of you who are watching, if you're uh, finding value in this, I hope you will share it and tell people what's valuable to you because uh, it really helps us to get comments. It really helps us to have people um, talking about here's what's useful in this and that, that helps us figure out what more we need to share next time. So thank you panelists. I'm really grateful for you being here and all of you watching. I'm really grateful for you being here. And Tom, I'm really grateful for you being here. Thank you, Josh. And I would like to echo your thank you to all the panelists for this very inspiring conversation. And it's uh, and we all know how needed this is in these times. Uh, we all have a lot of time on our hands to think about how can we grow our resilience and um, what how are we going to invest in ourselves? Um, so one idea that we can offer, um, we have a lot of free classes and some paid um, schedule every week. That's just one thing you can do. Um, the other thing that I would like to say is that we, you know, we have um, panels every week like this one. And I feel like every topic that we explore, just another idea for us to um, keep growing in a different way. So next week's topic is gonna be finding purpose, which is very much aligned um, to this week's panel. Um, also, I'd like to re remind you that um, if you like this video, please subscribe uh, to our channel or like and share the video. That helps us as much as anything you else you can do. Um, and um, yeah, I would like love. Thank you for having uh, been here with us today, and uh, hope to see you soon again. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Take care.